Hello. Welcome all of you to our fifth session on post-colonial studies. Uh, today we'll be talking about Edward Said's Orientalism. And uh, it would just be a general conversation about Orientalism, as you already know that I am doing a detailed word-to-word -word reading of Orientalism on my channel, and you can always watch those videos. But today, I'm hoping to just introduce the task, text and then see if you have any questions that I can answer, if anything that you would like to bring up. So that's the mission today. And please do keep in mind, this is a continuous ongoing course. And uh, I will keep adding more and more discussion materials to it. But that's the plan today. And uh, so as you join in, I will start you know, a general conversation about the text. Uh, but let me welcome people. Right now I see uh, uh, Infinita is here and welcome from Spain. And let's see if anyone else joins us. But as you come in, just please uh, let me know that you are here and I would like to welcome you formally to our weekly class sessions. Um, overall, I hope you all are doing well and handling the pandemic well enough. And I hope you all are also staying safe and healthy. So, oh good, we got Oroko here too. We missed you last week. Welcome from Kenya. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I think uh, I was talking about you last week because I think we, we missed you last time, but welcome back. So uh, let me just start the conversation. Of course, Orientalism is one of the most important texts for post-colonial studies, but also generally for any kind of social sciences and humanistic studies. But it has a special place in the canon of post-colonial studies, and that is because of the project itself. Now, those of you who have read it or heard about it or even watched one of my videos on it, you already know that I do believe that this was one of, actually this was the first major work by an American scholar, by a Western scholar in America that uses Foucault's theory of discourse to unpack a very complex historical phenomena, which he names Orientalism. And so that's one reason the text is important. If you ever want to read a book length project that uses the author's understanding of Foucault's theory of discourse, this is the book for it. Without knowing discourse, you can't really do justice to Orientalism because you'll miss the point. Now the project, the question that he's trying to answer in this book is simply, it comes across to us through other texts of uh, Said, but in one of his interviews, he says that, look, what I was trying to answer is, um, why is it that when Europeans or Americans think of the Orient, and Orient for this text is not Far East, it's the Middle East, the Arab world that we call it. And uh, Said was asking this question, why is it that when people think of the Orient, especially in the West, even if they have not read much about it, or even if they have read much about it, or have never been there, that they already have certain predisposed ideas about that region of the world, right? And most of the time, those ideas tend to be negative, right? And that, that phenomena, which predisposes a Western reader, a Western scholar, or a Western traveler to see the Orient, the Islamic Orient, a certain way, is what he calls Orientalism. And sets out to explain what it is and how does it work, right? Keep that in mind. Now, on a side note, you can take the same concept and apply it anywhere else. You know, Africa as a region has always had this problem in the European imagination. I mean, I just finished teaching Heart of Darkness 
and the latent racism and the blatant racism in the book already exposes you that Africa has always been either used as this exotic space, this space of adventure for the European males, right? Or a space that is considered primitive. So if you want to use Orientalism to study Africa, you could actually write a whole book on the knowledge produced about Africa and how it predisposes Europeans to see Africa a certain way. And, and you could still use the same argument. So, and so many other regions. So I'm gonna stop here and welcome people. So I've already welcomed uh, Infinita and Oroko. Mohammed Imran is here, welcome. And then uh, Akshali is here. Uh, welcome. And please do let us know also where you're joining us from. I know Infinita is from Spain, from Madrid. Oroko is joining us from Kenya. Uh, Imran, I think you're joining us from Pakistan. And then Akshali, uh, probably from India, but I could be wrong. So yeah, do, do introduce yourselves. And uh, I do want you to get to know each other as well. So good. Good to have you here. So while uh, people are coming in, also, uh, please uh, do always uh, interact with the videos and let me know if there is anything else that I can do. Um, quite a few people usually ask me very complex questions in the comments, but I'm sorry because it's very hard for me to answer a question of theory or a philosophical question in the comments. So when I have time, I record something about it. But bear in mind that all these videos and even these lectures are kind of launching pads for you to, you know, go on and read on your own and learn on your own because these lectures cannot just be, you know, the final point of your learning. So I hope you understand it. So, okay, Muhammad Uwais from Pakistan, welcome. And Louisa uh, from Guatemala. Oh, great. So I have a quite an eclectic group here. Uh, uh, and uh, that's great, that's great. And uh, great, I'm glad, Infinita, that you're here. So, I mean, here is the beauty of this medium, the internet, right? Uh, uh, usually, I will not never be able to talk to you or have a conversation with you. Uh, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you know, I work at a university, right? At a research university, people pay money, right? to come and take my courses, right? But how beautiful is it because of this medium? I mean, the way I am discussing these texts with you, this is exactly how I do it, how I do in graduate classes, right? Which people pay for. So I'm so glad that we can short circuit that whole economism of education and come together every now and then and talk about literature and theory. And I'm delighted that you take the time to join me. Okay, CZ from Delhi, Zindabad, welcome. Okay, so let me go into, uh, as I said, uh, we are doing a reading series on Orientalism. And I think I've already recorded about 12 videos on it, which is on my Orientalism series. So if you really want to read it along with me and see the discussions, you can always, I highly recommend those videos. But Today, we'll do a general discussion of it. Uh, so let me also welcome Will from South Africa. We have people already from like six or seven different countries. That's delightful. Okay, so as I mentioned in the beginning, right? Uh, what Said's project is to use Foucault's theory of discourse to unravel some very important questions about the Middle East, about the Orient, and that is, why is it that the Europeans and Americans have these predisposed, pre-inscribed ideas of the Islamic Orient when they think about it? And what he is suggesting here is um, uh, that it is not accidental, that it is not an in individual event, that there is a discourse behind it. There is a systematic discourse behind it. Okay, Will. Thank you from South Africa. Great. Okay. So I think I've welcomed everyone. So what does he mean by that? So in order to understand it, you have to understand that a rough 
understanding of Foucault's theory of discourse simply is that a body of knowledge, scientific knowledge probably must be developed by experts, right? Experts who have prestigious positions in the world, whose uh, writings are disseminated, published, read. This entire network comes together to define a discourse and then power plays a huge role in it. Okay, how? Said gives the example of the Napoleon, Napoleonic invasion of Egypt. So what he says is that in order to represent Egypt to Europeans the way it is represented, you need to be there as a European person, but you need to be there as in position of power where you can study Egypt, you can record it, then you can publish those recordings and disseminate that. So the discourse of that knowledge is made possible through power, right? So power and production of knowledge come together to create through historical accounts of the Middle East, through romantic novels about the Middle East, through stories about the Middle East, reports written by uh, the civil administrator of the colonial regimes. All of these come together as a body of knowledge, discursive knowledge that people consume, read in the newspapers, in the libraries, in their classrooms, and hence develop this idea of the Middle East in their minds. And it's so deeply embedded that even when they go there, they still see the Middle East discursively from the point of view of the knowledge that they already carry. So the real experience even sometimes doesn't alter that view. And that is what he's trying to capture and discuss in Orientalism. Now, he already in the, in the introduction tells us that his account is not exhaustive, right? He, he basically says, I'm not going to include the German scholars. I mean, he gives his reasons for it. You can watch my lecture on introduction for that. But what he says is that I'm going to focus on the French and the British scholars, poets, and writers over the last 300 years to give you this idea that this discourse is perpetual, is, has existed, it's perpetuated, it is institutionalized, and it informs policy as well as the politics of Europeans towards the Middle East. And then he also goes into the American version of Orientalism, which according to him is always mediated through US relationships with Israel, right? And, and that's another layer of the discourse on the Orient. Now, remember Saeed uh, had written two other works. They kind of form a trilogy. So Culture and Imperialism comes after this. And then the third book, Covering Islam, comes after that. These are the three books that roughly deal with these issues. So that roughly is the project of Orientalism, right? To answer the question as to why is it that the Europeans and Americans have these preconceived ideas of the East, but especially of the Islamic East, right? And what discourse underwrites it? How is that created and perpetuated? That discourse is what he calls Orientalism, right? And then he also spends a lot of time in, in kind of unraveling the American imperialism and American Orientalism. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Obviously, I can't cover the whole book here. But as I said, I highly recommend the book. And then uh, I highly recommend the lecture series that we've already started on Orientalism. I think we are on page 40 by now. But in that series, I read um, the book, parts of the book, and then I discuss them with you. And I, I would uh, love for you to join that. So I'm going to stop here briefly and see if you have any questions. If you do, then I'll build on that. If not, I'll continue further my discussion of probably the critiques of Orientalism and where do they come from and what are some of the problems people see with it in, in the field of post-colonial studies.
Okay. Questions, questions. And by the way, this will be available in an edited version. Okay, I always go and edit these lectures and then re-upload them so that, you know, like these breaks are not including there so that if you come back to them. And all of these, uh, the archive of these lectures, of course, is available on YouTube, but I'm also going to put these links on the website where you go to find out what we are doing next, and that is postcolonial. Net. Okay, so Femida has also joined us. Welcome. Welcome. Wa alaikum as -salam. And uh, also, uh, Femida, you just joined us. We just did a brief description of Orientalism, which will be available, of, of course, in a recorded version. But at this point, I'm saying uh, we've started our conversation. If you have any questions that you want me to address right in the beginning, I'll be happy to do that. So I'm waiting for someone to ask a question. Good, Femida. That's a really good question. You're, we are slightly ahead of it. I have a video on reorientalism, uh, which you can watch in your own time on my channel. I personally disagree with it. There is only one or two people who have written an article on reorientalization. That's a complete uh, uh, misunderstanding of what orientalism is. You cannot reorientalize as an individual. Uh, it has to be part of a discourse of reorientalization. So if you acknowledge that orientalism is not an individual project, but it's structural and it needs a huge discourse behind it, then what people are calling reorientalism, what they are saying is that these authors from Pakistan and India pander their stereotypes to America. And they want to call it reorientalism. I mean, there are better terms for that. You can say they are pandering the exact the exotic there, whatever, but it isn't reorientalization because there is no large discourse behind it. And that's a complete misreading of orientalism that we just talked about, that orientalism needs a power structure behind it, a, a body of knowledge, institutions of prestige, texts that are disseminated. And it is done to a level where people actually think in those terms. They are not even intending it. They are thinking it. Now, in the beginning pages of the book, chapter one, uh, Said starts with Said starts with two kinds, two examples, uh, Alfred Balfour and, and Cromer. Balfour was the prime minister of Britain and Cromer was the chief administrator of Egypt. And through their statements, he, he proves to us that not only did they see that it was their right to hold Egypt and govern it, but that they also believed that Egypt needed that kind of guidance and, ha guidance and hand holding. The question that he is trying to answer is of obviously this belief system is not natural, right? what underwrites it. Now, what Saeed would say is, what underwrites is, is the discourse of Orientalism, right? Um, uh, so, uh, is there anything called Neo-Orientalism? I don't know, <laughs> I've never really used it, because if it exists here right now, Orientalism exists in the United States, it's obviously Orientalism. There is nothing new about it, right? It's a continuation of Orientalist thought. Uh, similarly, um, Reorientalism, as I understand it, it's people using it to suggest that, okay, Babsi Sidwa reorientalizes, uh, the, the, these are, texts that are mobilized against native or diasporic authors from the former colonies by suggesting they are reorientalizing us. Um, that doesn't figure pro very prominently in my thought because in order for them to be reorientalizers, they have to be part of a re reorientalizing discourse, which needs that kind of power to do so. Uh, and I don't think so they have that. Um, now, of course, you could argue that the market forces 
force these authors to play with Orientalist tropes in their writing, but that is a different vocabulary. That doesn't mean that these authors single-handedly can reorientalize another culture. It is never an individual project, right? It's a discursive project which needs a structure behind it. Uh, good questions, though. Okay, any other questions about the book or about Said that you would like me to address? Good, okay, thank you. Okay, so while you are coming up with questions, there are quite a few critiques of, uh, okay, I have yearning star, welcome, welcome. So there are quite a few critiques of Orientalism, the major one in In Theory by Ajaz Ahmed, by Robert Young. Uh, so the critiques come from different uh, circles. Okay, so first of all, from, from the left, from the uh, progressive scholars, one of the major critiques is that Saeed is too culturalist. I mean, uh, that critique, Saeed actually once pointed out that no, he is, he's a, uh, he knows his Marx and all. So one of the critiques comes from the misquotation of Marx in the beginning of the book, right? From the 18th Boromir, where, he, where Saeed quotes that, uh, uh, Right there, it's in the start of the book, right where Marx's famous statement that they cannot represent themselves, they must be represented. So these critiques come from the Marxists who, who basically suggest that, you know, the Orientalism is too culturalist. It doesn't take into account the materialistic and, and class assumptions of the Middle East itself. And Saeed in the afterword basically says, well, the culture that I am reading is the same way as Raymond Williams and others read the culture. Culture is always political, but that's one of the critiques from the Marxist, the culturalist assumption, uh, nature of the text itself. Uh, then uh, uh, some critiques come from the American right, from the conservatives, and they, they are pretty shallow critiques because they always don't even read his introduction carefully, right? Because they are, what about Occidentalism, right? Uh, because the Arabs think about us a certain way too. And what the answer to that is, yeah, there can be individual prejudices uh, against the West and I have heard them too, but the only time it will become Occidentalism is when there is a discourse of power behind it when the Arabs can come to United States, record it, write about it, make that knowledge universal, perpetuate it, then it will be Occidentalism. Other than that, you're comparing apples and oranges. But so the critiques are pretty shallow. Uh, of course, I mean, Said responded to those critiques, especially in Orientalism, you will see that you do not hear the voice of the natives. You, you don't know what they were thinking. Said's answer is that um, his job in Orientalism was not to trace that, but to trace how the Orient is constructed in the European imagination. But by and large, sometimes even when I was reading it the first time, the idea was what there is a material orient that doesn't come across. They cannot just be a construct of Europe, right? That's giving too much power to the Orientalist discourse. Uh, so in that sense, some that critique would be valid. What about the lived experiences of the Orientals themselves? And then, of course, in one of his interviews, Said also uh, kind of undercuts his own argument. He's like, well, yeah, I mean, yes. A lot of it is being done by the West and by America. But I mean, if you look at the Islamic word, his words were, you know, there is not even a single viable democracy, right? And most of them are dictatorships or some, some of them are puppet regimes run by dictatorships. So what his argument was that we are not doing any favors. We are actually making their job easier to mobilize these stereotypes about us. Of course, there are material and other reasons for these dictatorships and other peoples have explained it, but that's also one of the problems with the text, right? Uh, because by asserting that the Orient 
was a discursive product of Europe. It kind of takes away any agency within this text. Of course, he goes and undoes that in his other works of the natives themselves within this text. So those are some of the critiques. Um, I have a question here. Uh, well, Said is himself guilty of making, I won't say that. Uh, not generalizations of that kind. So one beauty of Said's work is that uh, he's pretty thorough and a diligent scholar. Now, in his political statements, maybe, because Said was also very active politically for the Palestinian cause. But I don't think so we could say he makes huge generalizations, not in Orientalism. I mean, but things are pretty precise. The texts are cited and discussed. He might generalize in his assumptions, but every scholar does that. But I, I would be very reluctant to say Said makes huge generalizations. Um, Femida, can you please explain a little about Said's reference of Foucault's knowledge and power and the construction of Orient through? Well, I can explain it here, but if you watch my series on Orientalism, it's actually very well explained over there. Uh, so the way he is using Foucault, and he cites two of Foucault's work, is by suggesting that a discourse comes to be because of because knowledge and power come together. And when knowledge and power come together, the power within power, certain people have the right to research. They have the power to access a space, record it, produce materials about it. And Orientalism as a discourse is made possible by that position of dominance that Europeans had over the Orient. Because of that then, it becomes a field of study. Orient becomes a career, right? There are social scientists who are studying it. There are geographers, cartographers who are recording it. There are historians who are trying to recover the history. So it becomes a discourse in which most of its experts are Europeans. They are interested in it and they are recording it. That knowledge is then perpetuated through universities. It is taught. It is read. It becomes part of the civil services curriculum. So courses are taught to civil servants who are going to Egypt or India or elsewhere. So discursively speaking, even before you get to Egypt or get to Syria, you've already learned your Syria through those texts. And that is the discursive aspect of it. Then when you get there, you don't just say, I am here, these are Syrians. You also have a view of different segments of Syrian society. How do they work? And you use those assumptions. And sometimes if they don't fit the stereotype of what you have in your mind, you don't try to change, alter your views of it. You read it as an aberration or you read it as, as something not meeting your expectations. Um, how does a discourse work? Uh, individual examples of how to read. Uh, let's say in uh, 18th century Europe, the India was always considered this place of riches, right? And the Indian emperor, right, was one of the richest people on the planet, the Mughal emperor, right? The Mughal king. Uh, so the myth was that uh, the king is greedy, right? And that's how his actions were reported. And what was that built on that these 19th century, early, uh, late 18th, these business people, mercantile capitalists from Europe want, want to present something to the great Mughal, right? So they, they build a beautiful rath, right? Uh, a chariot, right? And it is brass inlaid and everything else, right? And they take it to the wazir and say, this is for Shahanshah Akbar. And the wazir looks at it and says, this is not worthy of our king, okay? I want to save you the embarrassment of not presenting this to our king because it has brass on it. There are no gemstones. This is not a gift worthy of our king. So I will not permit you to present it. So the company employee then writes back and says, oh man, the great Mughal is so greedy. 
he wants gold. So that's kind of a discourse that already has placed this person in that, that cycle and then matches it. How does a discourse work on a little level as you and me? Okay, if, if I am visiting Spain, let's say Infinita's country, well, how do I learn about it? I go to the internet and I say 10 best things to do in Madrid. I read, I buy a guidebook, travel book. So think of it, how that travel book and what and the value that we assign to it because you know a reputable company wrote it and all already predisposes us it already decides for us what is worth seeing in madrid and when we get there that expectation is already in our mind so all we are doing is experiencing the actual space but our mind is saying is it exact is it meeting whatever it was written about it or is it disappointing, right? It's because our perception was already shaped about the experience that we might have. And we are judging the experience based on the assumptions that we brought there. On a larger scale, that's what a discourse does. Um, yeah, the, the cover of the book, the, this comes uh, from the Dutch paintings. Uh, Dutch impressionistic paintings that Said had also criticized in this book and other books. And th this is an orientalized image of the court of a sultan, right? Uh, with a little boy performer with his snake. And, uh, and uh, there is a critique of uh, these kind of orientalist paintings because what they do is they and that is part of the discourse. They place the Orient within an ossified, unchanging time with these, you know, medieval rituals, right? And so it it kind of gives this idea that Orient is unchanging. It's about camels. It's about people with long beards or mysterious men and sensual women, all those tropes are mobilized through stories, through romantic novels, through historical accounts. And he gives you an account in introduction, you know, of a courtesan whose voice we do not hear, but who is an object of desire for two people who write about her, Flaubert and another. So this whole idea of the power to represent the Orient in a certain way. Uh, now, do keep in mind that when we are seeing these medieval kings, the difference is that we still think of the Middle East in these terms. Like when, when the Crusaders go to the Orient, the Muslim Empire has fallen down, but it has small principalities. We already assumed that the Europeans were better than them. But do we, do we know what the sanitation conditions were in Paris? How did people live? What kind of medicine did they practice, right? Um, these were the people who crucified people in public. In every town square, you will see people in different shapes of torture on public display because they were being punished. This is the culture which we don't think about. All we think about is here are the crusaders. They are good Christians that they are bringing um, light to these heathen lands. And the idea of that land is ossified while Europe we see differently that it has developed over time. And that is one of the challenges that Orientalism is trying to deal with is, is representing the Orient as prehistoric, as unchanging, as ossified, as uh, mysterious, as dangerous maybe. And the way it is done is through the discourse of Orientalism. Okay, Infinita. Actually, I was already thinking about these assumptions and preconceptions that exist about South European countries. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Like, you know, that's why in the beginning of this talk, I said that you can take the basic argument of Orientalism and apply it to any large scale assumptions about a group of people. The only difference is it cannot be an individual prejudice. It will have to be systematic. Now, if you you could also say, take the all the Orientalist tropes and go and look at popular writings in Europe, 
especially in Italy and other parts of Europe, um, writings, songs, ballads, and see how the Roma are viewed, right? And, and then you could argue that the way they are viewed, the way they are treated are part of this discourse of against the nomadic people who might have their own culture. And that you, you could pick up the argument of this uh, Orientalism and apply it there. As I talked to Oracle, we can already apply it to Africa, right? The only prerequisite is that you can't say, oh, you are an individual Orientalist. Your thought, you have to place it in a larger body of work where scholars, writers, poets normalize write and perpetuate a certain way of seeing a certain segment of society, a certain gender, a certain group of people, and then it would be a certain kind of Orientalism. Uh, uh, you can do this actually to patriarchy as well, right? Uh, if someone wanted to write about, okay, how is it that women are viewed a certain way in Hinduism or Islam or Christianity, you could point to the discourse of patriarchy, how the sacred texts underwrite it, how the people who write the exegesis of it further elaborate on it, how are laws built upon it, how do poets write about femininity and women's behavior, women's role, and then further take it deeper into how does that discourse develop. Now, Infinita is from Spain. Uh, those of you who are not aware, Spain uh, was the last one of the European nations in development of women's rights and equality. They are still fighting for it. But if I'm not wrong, the first female journalist, TV journalist, probably was introduced on TV in late 70s or early 80s. Right. So it's not just a struggle in India and in Pakistan, e even what we consider the bastion of equal rights, women rights movements have to struggle every single day. It also depends on whether it's a Protestant country, a Catholic dominant country, Shia dominant country. But all of that we can argue through Orientalism if we can point to a body of work, literature, research, social sciences, religious exegesis, a sacred text, how it is disseminated and perpetuated, and does it have power centers, centers of prestige associated with it. You connect these things together, you have an Orientalist discourse. You can call it the discourse of patriarchy, you can call it the discourse of racism, but the principle will be the same. Absolutely. Patriarchy, yes. So what I'm saying is that Orientalism by itself has now become a technical term, but we can use the same method to unravel and talk about any other discourses of dominance that might exist and that we might. And we can even, uh, as scholars, go by saying, here is how Said describes Orientalism. I'm now going to take the same structure of constructing ideas and discussing them and apply it to the discourse of this in our culture or discourse of that in, in our culture, and that would work. Um, okay, let me go to questions. Occidentals, Occidentalism is not as much vigilant as Orientalism. Or, or do you think there is a need to write back? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And there is quite a lot being written back, was always being written back. The only thing, reason we can't call it Occidentalism is that post 18th century yeah, you can sit in the privacy of your own madrasa or your own church and write against Europe and do all that, but it, it is not combined with power to be there and power to alter that culture and rewrite its histories. Unless it has that power, it is not Occidentalism. And the reason I'm saying 
I'm opposing Occidentalism is because the conservative scholars here are trying to suggest that, oh, just as there is Orientalism, there is Occidentalism. As a, that, that's how they use the term reverse racism. And we have to go and tell them, no, it is not reverse racism because it's not institutionalized. A person of color like me can have a prejudice against a Caucasian person in America, but it cannot qualify as reverse racism because I don't have the discursive power behind it for it to become a norm. And so the reason I'm reluctant to accept Occidentalism as a plausible term in opposition to Orientalism is because it lacks the discursive in infrastructure and power that made Orientalism possible. So as someone working from India, from Pakistan, just know that when you buy into the term Occ Occidentalism and agree with it, you are also agreeing with the most reactionary response from America against the left and against Orientalism. So you're basically accepting responsibility that just as American dominant groups can be racist, so are we. That is at stake. That is why understanding these concepts in their depth is important as a scholar. Uh, okay, Louisa, let me look at your question. It is amazing how European paintings representations from the 19th century have crystallize in people's imaginary, which still influence our perception and how it is produced. And yes, and I agree with you. And the, another thing is that the visual image is usually more powerful, right? I mean, scientifically, we know that we, when the things we see in opposition to what we read, I think we have 80% more chance of, uh, of uh, uh, keeping the images that we see, that that they we retain them longer. And two, the images that we see also shape our aesthetic, our perception of another culture. So if you like, if you remember, if you see these Dutch paintings, you know, there is always a woman standing in a very sexualized manner, and she has a picture, there is there are men smoking hookahs. And if you keep seeing these in exhibitions, in reproductions or in originals, then by and large, you know, if there is an Orientalist art exhibit or, or Orientalist art course or whatever, then those images do have the power to shape your perce perception discursively of these people called Arabs, just as in the European imagination, you know, through cartoons, through images, through stories, right? The Jewish stereotype was mobilized, right? And what are the drastic consequences of when a stereotype becomes normalized within an institution, right? That based on that, those cultural stereotypes, orientalized stereotypes, people can be put to death, millions of them, six millions of them right? Those are the ultimate consequences of these discourses. Because if you also add a little dehumanization in there and posit them as irrational, as, you know, recalcitrant, as people you can't argue with, then maybe when it comes time to fight against them, you can then assume that this is, how was, you know, how did Holocaust become palatable to so many doctors and scientists because the German idea of nationalism was organistic, right? Germans, the Nazis, not the Germans. Uh, the Nazis imagined Germany to be a living organism, right? And since they posited it uh, not in mechanistic terms, right, as an organized social body, but as a natural living being, they could then posit that it can have contagion right? It can have something that can infect it. Then they could posit that infection to the Jewish population, to the gays and lesbians, to the leftists, right? And then eventually, then logically, there is no causal link to that, but that kind of imagination can then lead you to excise the contagion, because that's what you do, like the sick part, you remove it. So if you think of it, the dangerous consequences of thought 
and discourse and what it can enable murder and killing of 9 million people, right? By a nation that by and large called itself civilized, right? That is what is at stake when a discourse can perpetuate itself and is accepted uncritically. You can apply it to any discourse, you know, religious discourse, you know, um, patriarchy underwritten by religion. All they have to do is throw a book at you. This is what God says. Who cares, man, what God says? It's 21st century. But no, for a lot of people, that's the final word. As if we have the capacity to read the mind of God. I mean, that's what always perplexes me. How can people claim that we being humans contain, you know, the intention of God in our mind? That is an impossibility. That means God can be limited to my mind, right? If God can be limited to my mind, then it is not a God. Uh, uh, so, yes, yeah, uh, infinita, of course, you know, during time of Franco. And, and that I think in so many ways, Spain is still recovering from that. And also the influence of the Catholic Church, right? That is a huge influence too. So two things combined, um, Franco, and, and, and the Catholic Church and its, its hierarchies. So uh, for women's rights and others, people have had to struggle really hard in Spain. Um, so what, I'm, what it also teaches us is that there are no monolithic Western cultures or Eastern cultures and that everyone has their fights. And on, that is what we build our global solidarities on, not monolithic cultural universalities, but the nature of our local struggles connected with the global imperatives. Um, okay, so overall then, it's just an introduction. So Orientalism significance is that it is one of the most prominent book in post-colonial studies, but it also then launches changes in anthropology and sociology because increasingly the scholars there who previously only had a Eurocentric view of the cultures that they were studying suddenly start also trying to understand their own discursive biases. Because what Orientalism then teaches us is not necessarily how to do it better, but what it teaches us is that whatever we do, but the way we view another culture, the way we view another race, the way we view another gender, especially when from a dominant position, we need to train ourselves to see what underlying discourse and power structure is enabling that. How is that being perpetuated? How is that being disseminated and accepted by a vast majority of people who might be in a dominant group? And then it it then challenges those assumptions. So a lot of disciplines and fields of study have to kind of rethink themselves and change their practices after Orientalism comes out. And I think had it been just a purely Marxist book, it would have not had that kind of appeal. But because it had a culturalist emphasis, because he's studying culture, he's studying it politically, I think that's why the book made more of an impact because it wasn't just, oh, here is another class critique and critique of the mode of production. It was something that was actually playing with the very cultural discourse that enabled so many things and policies and everything else under colonialism and then in American imperialism that the book was even more convincing to a lot of people. And uh, Okay, so this is the, I know uh, you people are probably being feeling cheated that I'm not like really going into the book and uh, discussing different passages of it. But my idea is that I just wanted to introduce the book. What is its logic built upon with a hope that of course you will actually read the book, right? And, uh, and then think about it critically, but just also to let you know what is its significance, right? And as I already pointed out, 
you know, the detailed lectures on Orientalism are continuing on my channel, right? We, we have a whole series on reading Orientalism where I actually read the text and talk to you about it. And I think we have covered the introduction and we have covered chapter one up to page 40. So that conversation is a longer conversation and it will continue happening. But this is just briefly um, talking about Orientalism as a text and its significance. Now, when I teach it in my classes, of course, the students read it and then we discuss whatever specifics that they bring to me from the book. Okay, so can you elaborate native Orientalism and native Orientalists? Okay, once again, for native Orientalism to be considered Orientalism, the native group that is guilty of that will have to be in a dominant situation. They will have to be the dominant group. And then they will have to have institutions of power, the government, the police, the universities, the journals, right? To produce that discourse, churches, temples. And then they will have to have a group, a constituency within their own nation, which is viewed through that discourse. And that would be a kind of native Orientalism. So let me give you example, let's say from India. And uh, this is hypothetical. I don't know the exact detail. Let's say a discourse develops in India where a certain caste says, we are the privileged group. Um, we are the ones to whom India belongs. Here are the sacred texts that say that. Here are the duties that each one must perform within their caste. And then they perpetuate it through the temples, through universities, through student organizations, and a, and a dominant group emerges with that ideology. And then with that discourse, they say this particular group is an outsider group. These are the reasons. And then they impugn on to them they are unchanging, they are uncompromising, they are irrational. And that impugning must depend on the knowledge produced by this dominant group, right? It cannot just be blaming others, then it's not Orientalism. So for native Orientalism to exist, there has to be a body of knowledge perpetuated, disseminated, written by people who have the authority to pronounce something about other cultures and other groups then that knowledge has to be disseminated so that a dominant group internalizes its logic. It is in poetry, it is in drama, it is represented in film. And then that shapes a certain view of a native group, a minority group or another group in that dominant discourse. Only then will it become native Orientalism. Otherwise, it will be communalism. It would be racism. It would be xenophobia. But in order for it to become an orientalized discourse, it has to have all those things that I pointed out, that Said points out about orientalism. That's why we also use the term, instead of using native orientalism, uh, we use the term internal colonialism. Spivak theorizes the fourth word term as fourth word. Fourth words are the populations within the developing nations who do not have access to the promise of the independent uh, um, post-colonial state. So women could be, working class women could be part of the fourth world. In India, you can count the Dalit population as part of the fourth world. You can, you can the Adivasis, the mountain people, all of those could be part of the fourth world. In Pakistan, it could be the tribal people, the women, the rural populations, uh, the, the enslaved labor, you know, in the south and everywhere, you know, uh, whom we call Haris or Mazaras. So I think those terms can do more justice to these internal differences than native Orientalism. But I think, I, I hope I did explain it. Okay. 
All right. So yeah, SK, thank you for joining us. Mary, thank you for joining us. I, I welcomed everyone else, but thank you all for joining us. Um, so um, just to remind you, we do this every Saturday unless you know there is an emergency and we meet at 10 my time, which is uh, US central time. And I always announce it on the website, postcolonial.net and on the YouTube channel. So please always join us. Uh, uh, and it's always fun to have you here. And if you have any questions, I'll of course answer them. Uh, also, I would be really grateful if you could pass it on to others, you know, like if you have a friend who might be able to join us or, uh, or who might be able to benefit from these conversations. Uh, so pass it on to others, the more the merrier. And uh, and I'm as I said, the, these are very invigorating things for me. These exchanges, and I don't do it for you, right? I actually there's a very selfish end to it, and that is that I actually every Saturday I am excited about it, and when after I'm done, you know, I feel like I feel happier, and so it's a very selfish end in these exchanges. But if it benefits you a little bit, that's good too. Um, Oh, good, Femida. Thank you so much. Yeah, please share it with others. And also, you know, help promote the channel as well, because there's a lot of educational content there which people can use. And, uh, and I keep producing more and more, so. Good. Thank you, Femida. Thank you. Yeah. And, oh, Dr. Shazia Yaz is here, too. Thank you for joining us. Great. You see? Now, uh, so that's it, Louisa, thank you. So I think I'm gonna stop here. We've been going for 55 minutes. So overall, one of the most important texts for post-colonial studies, but for other studies as well, came out in 1978. Um, but in order to understand it, you will have to understand Foucault's theory of discourse, and then how does a discourse come together through knowledge, through power, through institutions of prestige, enunciating subjects who are the scholars, poets, and writers. And the idea is that all of that knowledge creates the Orient into a certain discursive entity that people internalize and that sometimes they take with them those ideas and those assumptions about the Orient it being timeless, it being unchanging, it being needing guidance and governance. So all of that, you know, is absolutely part of this discussion. Oh, we have another new member, Mary. Okay, welcome. And I think Mary has also joined uh, our channel as a member. That's why uh, her comment is highlighted in green. Thank you so much. Uh, and you can see uh, those of you who become members of my channel, you get that fist next to your comments. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. So, um, so I'm going to pause a little more and see if there are any uh, last minute questions. And if there are, I'll be happy to answer them. And, uh, you know, by the middle of next week, I will decide what we are going to do next. And if you have any suggestions, please send them my way when I upload the edited version of this lecture, just go to the, um, or you can also always go to the community tab and post your suggestions there. Uh, but I will come up with whatever we are doing next Saturday. And uh, that is kind of all I have. Now, Mary, you just joined us. So uh, let us know if you have any questions or comments and I'll be very happy to answer that. or any other thing that you want to share. It becomes kind of boring. We are always talking about literature and theory. So it's fun now, right? It's like we have quite a few regulars, right? We have Imran, I think, who joins us every week. We have Infinita. Oroko joins us pretty much every week. Ovas joins us pretty much every week. 
uh, uh, Will, I am not sure, but uh, Louisa, I think this is your first time. But we have quite a few people who, who come and join. And Oh, yes, uh, Yearning Star, you have joined us before. So that's what I was saying before so many of you came is that, um, I mean, of course, I don't just do it for you. This is not public service. It, it is deeply gratifying to me as well. Every week, I look forward to it. But also what I'm offering here is uh, pretty much what my students get in my classes, right? The only difference is we, we don't sit and talk about text so intimately. Uh, oh, Hina, welcome. But other than that, I mean, I can tell you my graduate students uh, to sit in a class like this, you know, they pay a lot of money in tuition fees to do this. So I think it's really fun that we can do it just if we have access to internet and we don't have to worry about, you know, money or anything. Um, and and that, that it's not a service to you that it really, really is invigorating for me personally. And I enjoy these exchanges. Uh, so Hina, Hina Mir, welcome. You know, Mir is my mother's last name too. So to me, it tells me that you or your family were from the Sirinagar Valley because my mother was Kashmiri. So cool. Okay, so I'm going to pause here, give you a few moments, and then if all is well, I'll take your permission to sign off and hope to see you next week, okay? And uh, good, Saqib, Sayyid Saqib Ahmed, thank you. Um, I hope you were here all this time because if you have just come again, we are already concluding um, our discussion. But obviously, I will see you all next week, right? And uh, OK, welcome, Saqib. Great, I'm fine. And uh, as I was saying, okay, Mary, let's see what you have to say. I have just come across post-colonial studies, so I'm just taking it slowly since I'm not from literature, but it seems really an, oh, great. And Mary, I mean, uh, you know that if, if you are not a, a literature student, that's okay. You can also go to my website, Right, which is postcolonial.net. I'll put it here. And I have a lot of content there, but also you can see my course archive is there. So you can see what kind of courses uh, I offer. And then if you have time, of course, the YouTube channel has all the basic things about postcolonial studies. And one thing that I do also in a lot of those videos is also point out how this knowledge is not just only related to literary studies, but how it relates to other fields as well. But also how does it make us into better people, into you know people who can go and do some good in the world. So welcome. And as always, if you have any questions, just post them under any of the videos and do join us every week so that we can build on that. OK, Saqib, um, good. Uh, good luck with your thesis on English. And I highly encourage you to read Orientalism. Uh, and that would help you a lot. And then. Uh, also watch other videos. But those of you who are working on your degrees, please do keep in mind that you know there is no shortcut to reading. If you need a list on postcolonial studies, just go to postcolonial.net, look at POCO resources. At the bottom of that is reading list, which my PhD students use. So if you just pick up some text from there, you'll be fine. Other than that, you know, I wish you all the best in, in your studies. So, OK, I think I've said goodbye many times, but this time I'm going to ask your leave because I have to teach a class in a couple of hours. And I will hope to see you next week. And until then, take care, OK? And take care of yourselves, your families. Stay safe. And as I say always, 
peace and love. Okay. See you next week.